In this world, you will have trouble. God's people are no strangers to hard times. The Jews were slaves in Egypt, exiled in Babylon, David fought Goliath, Paul died in prison, Daniel was thrown into a den of lions. But we've always persevered because Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So wherever you are, however you feel in this time of trouble, take heart and stand strong. Well, good morning, Shoreline. We are talking for the next six weeks about standing strong when the world is crashing down. And you hear a title like that for a series and you think, man, that is a series that is tailor-made for this moment in history. And it is. This, this series is exactly the right, uh, the right series for right now, for Shoreline Church. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, I, I am what you would call an advanced planner. Uh, most people, if you say, well, is Kevin an advanced planner? They kind of laugh and say, Kevin's like a crazy advanced planner. As a matter of fact, the way it goes at Shoreline is before the summer... Uh, I began working with our pastors, with our leadership team. We talk and pray about where we need to go with our preaching and teaching for the next year. So like this time of the year, April, May, we start talking about what do we need for the following year. So in April, May of 2019, we were talking about 2020. And then in June, July, I go away for one week, sometime in the summertime, and I take all the ideas from our pastors and all the ideas from, from, from our leaders and what they, where they feel God's taking us, and I spend a week laying out the next year. So in the summer of 2019, I was laying out 2020. And in that preparation process, I put together a sermon on the book of Daniel called Standing Strong When the World is Crashing Down. And here's the titles for the first three sermons in that series that were planned in the summer of 2019. Now, we didn't know what was coming, but here's the beauty. God knows. And so here were the three first sermon titles for weeks one, two, and three. This week, Next Sunday and the following Sunday. Here's the titles. Stand strong when the world is crashing down. Week two. Stand strong when things look impossible. You feeling that at all these days? Here's the third week. Stand strong when your faith is being tested. Now, are these topics we need to be thinking about right now? Well, guess what? God loves us so much. He is so sovereign and on the throne that last summer... He prepared us to have this series at this moment. That just reminds me of God's presence and God's power. And, and we have to look and acknowledge that right now, we're in a tough time. I would just say it this way. Let's be honest. We are in tough times. I mean, if we're honest, if we acknowledge it, right now, this moment, may be one of the toughest moments historically that many of us will ever experience personally. I hope it is. I hope we can say this is like the worst time economically, the worst time uh, in, that we've ever experienced because it's a rough time. And when I look at where we are right now, I would say we're in a time of leadership tensions, leadership tensions within our own country, leadership tensions within states, leadership tensions globally. There's a lot of tensions in the leadership world right now. Economic turmoil. I mean, huge, deep economic turmoil. And, and I'd like to think, oh, it's going to be all fixed in a couple of weeks. But man, this, it's, it's, we're, in a, we're in a difficult season. Man, this is a tough time. National fears. I, I think there's people are looking and saying, what's, what's our country going to look like in three months, in six months, and in a year? And, and that can create a lot of tension inside and fears internally. And even what I would call religious rough waters. Well, what do you mean by religious rough waters? Well, I'm preaching in an empty room. <laughs> We're not even allowed to gather. It's not, it's not a, a thing against the church. Nobody's allowed to gather. But man, for the church particularly, you know, one of the things that God has designed is something that we call consistent community. One of the seven markers of spiritual maturity is consistent community. That's how God's made us, and we can't be together in that kind of community. It is a difficult time, religious rough waters. And I would suggest that this book of Daniel that we're going to be digging into for the next six weeks, and I can tell you, if you have friends and family members that need some encouragement and perspective in rough waters, this series will speak to their hearts. Encourage them, if they don't have a church they're going to, encourage them to join us for worship over these next six weeks. But I want to read from Daniel chapter 1, the first two verses, and I want to suggest to you that the kind of day we're facing today 
is as much what Daniel was facing, but, but even worse, even more difficult. So Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I'll explain what a siege is in just a moment. And besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. Lord Jesus, speak to us today. We need to hear from you. We need to hear your voice and hear your word come alive. So we open our hearts to receive what you want to speak. We open our minds to understand. And God, we open our lives to be changed by the truth of your word. Meet us by your Holy Spirit right where we are right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here's what happens historically. I'm going to show you a map, and you're going to see uh, Babylon, and you're going to see Jerusalem. And if you look at it, Babylon, you, there really wasn't a straight shot to Jerusalem because it was all desert. So they would actually, that, that, the route that you see with the red there, they would travel along the Euphrates Valley and then come down along the Mediterranean Sea. But, but the Babylonian army came and attacked Jerusalem, the capital of where God, basically the nation of God's people, the capital of Judah. And, and so the, the moment we're going to look at that where Daniel is happening is in this moment where they came, they attacked, they won and destroyed Jerusalem and took as prisoners of war many of the people from Jerusalem back to Babylon. And in that very moment in time, we're going to look at, look at Daniel, the book of Daniel, because he was in a tough time, just like we're in a tough time right now, but again, even tougher. So here's some of the things we see when we look at Daniel. There were leadership issues. There were leadership issues going on for Daniel. Jehoiakim was not a good king. Uh, and, and if you read about Jehoiakim in the Bible, you discover that, that with each of the kings of Israel, at the end of their life, God would give sort of a summary statement. They either did what was good in the eyes of the Lord, what was right and good, and they were a good king, or they did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they were a bad king. And Jehoiakim was considered evil in the eyes of the Lord. He, he, was, he was not... Uh, you know, named and labeled as a good king, but as an evil king. He made a lot of poor choices. As a matter of fact, he understood that Babylon uh, had authority and power in the world at that time, and he kept rebelling against them and pushing back, and this time he went too far, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, sent his forces and said, listen, deal with it. Squish this rebellion. That's it. So what happens is Daniel is thrown into this time in history where he discovers that there's leadership issues, just like we, you know, we're experiencing globally and nationally, challenges with leadership. There's economic issues. There's, there's actually a complete economic collapse that would make what we're going through right now look like child's play because they besieged Jerusalem. Now, you have to understand what a siege was. Uh, when a, a, an enemy army would come in, any city that was going to be lasting for very long in those days had a wall around it. They protected themselves with a wall. And Jerusalem was a walled city. But an army would come, and they would literally surround the city, close it in, and just wait. Sometimes they would put up what's called siege works, where they would put, come against the walls, and they would try to attack. But sometimes they would just camp out and wait. They would cut off their water. They would cut off their food. They would cut off everything and just starve them out. And so the economy could go from thriving to literally non-existent overnight if an enemy army came in and set up siege works against a city. And that's what happened with Jerusalem. The Babylonians came and they besieged the city. So there was economic collapse, national destruction. It's the fall of Jerusalem. This, this is, they're watching their capital city invaded, desecrated, demolished. So, so there's national, political, absolute upheaval. And then religious confusion, uh, that, that there's raiding of the temple, that the temple, which, which they believe was the dwelling place of Yahweh, God Almighty, is raided by the Babylonians. And they, they actually take the golden articles from the temple and they carry them back to Babylon and they put them in the temple of their pagan god, small g, false god. But in their minds, if we can take your temple, if we can take the articles and we put them in the temple of our god, then our god wins. And your God's nothing. So a lot of the people are feeling like, man, maybe does our God really have power? 
Can our God really stand for us and protect us? On every level, Daniel's going through an incredibly difficult time. And it's one of those moments where you say, you know, things just can't get worse. They can't get worse than this. Have you ever heard those moments where they just, it can't get any worse than this? But here's the reality. When things can't get any worse, sometimes they do. And you've been there, and so have I. Where you got so much bad news, you go, that, I can't take any more bad news. They can't get any worse than this. And all of a sudden, one more piece of bad news, one more diagnosis, one more news report, one more thing that says, I didn't, I didn't think it could get any worse. That's where Daniel is at. As a matter of fact, when it seems like it can't get any worse, Daniel becomes a prisoner of war. And I want to read his story to you. I want to encourage you, if you have your Bible, to open your Bible to Daniel chapter 1. If you have a Bible app, open your Bible app to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. Uh, This won't be on the screen. I want you to just to listen as I read the story or follow along in your own Bible. And I want you to get the flow of the story because for Daniel... When, when he watches his own, his own country people destroyed, when he watches the temple desecrated, when he watches the city fall, when he watches the foreign army come in and take over, he said, it can't get any worse. And, and for Daniel, it's, yes, it can. You're going to become a prisoner of war. And someone else is going to tell you what to wear, what to eat, how to live, everything. You become basically a slave in a foreign land. So follow along with me in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. So now, you know, we read that, they, that they, they took the city, they took the articles from the temple, they put them in the temple of their false god, and now Daniel and his friends are taken as prisoners of war, and in verse 3 we read this. Then the king, this is the king of Babylon, ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, kind of the best of the best, young men without any physical defect, handsome showing aptitude of every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, kind of the best of the best food, from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Just put your finger right there in your Bible and just just hold there for a minute. So Daniel becomes one of these prisoners of war. And and they say, we're going to teach you new language. We're going to give you new clothing. We're going to uh, to teach you a a whole new education. For three years, we're going to, basically, we're going to try to make you a Babylonian. That's the goal. And so now, we continue on in verse 6. Among those who were chosen for this, for this kind of re-educational program by the Babylonians, among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, which by the name, was, he was being named after one of the, the, the false gods of the Babylonians. Talk about a new name, and your new name is the name of a false god. Not a name you really want, Right? And so to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved, listen to those words, Daniel resolved, he made a deep choice in his soul. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should you be seen looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. And just for the record, when he says the king would have my head, it's not a metaphor. It's not symbolic language. He means if I'm in charge of you and you look worse than the other young men and it's because I didn't feed you what the king told me to feed you, he will chop my head off and put it on a platter. I mean, that, that was the temperament of King Nebuchadnezzar and, and Ashpenaz, the servant, knew that. So he says, this could be a dangerous, if I let you do this, this would be very dangerous for me. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief, push, uh, the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. I love the wisdom of Daniel. 
He says, okay, listen, 10 days can't hurt. Let's do a trial period. And Daniel just lays out the plan. And he says, okay, we can try it for 10 days and see what, hap- see what happens. Look at verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. I, I mean, that, that is powerful. I, I just want to read verse 17 then also. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. I mean, I mean this is, this is a, a staggering story. So here's Daniel and his friends. They've watched, their, the, they've watched the holy city of Jerusalem fall. They've watched total political upheaval. They've watched people they love executed and killed. They've watched the temple desecrated. They're taken as prisoners of war. They then are told that they're going to have to learn a new language and learn a new culture and have new education. And they're, they're asked to do all these different things. And, and, and there's almost a point where you, when, you read, when you read Daniel's story, when you read Daniel's story, you stop and think, okay, there's a point where you just go, that's it. I've had it. I can't, I can't take any more. Is there a point where, where Daniel just finally says, God, it's too much? So here's the question. Is there a point you just give up? Is there a point where in life where things get tough? I mean, we're in a tough time right now. You know, what's, what's our threshold? What's, our, what's the point where we say, God, I can't take any more. God, if this is the way it's going to be, I don't know if I can press on. What's the point at which you just say, I can't take it anymore? And as I was thinking about this and pondering this idea of is there a point, you know, for Daniel in this process where he just says, I give up? Is there a point for us where we say, I give up? I had flashed into my mind a story I heard years ago about this, about this young man named David Ring. And I actually went online and I, and I learned more about him and I found out some things that I want to share with you. But the story of David Ring, I found that this, this young man was born with severe cerebral palsy. So he was born with physical challenges, verbal challenges. The doctors said they didn't think he would ever speak. And then they said, and he'll, and he told the parents, he'll probably never speak, he'll probably never communicate very well. He'll never get married. He'll never have children. It's just, it's just that's not going to be his life. And the doctors kind of brace the parents for this future. So for David Ring, life was hard. And then he lost both of his parents when he was 14 years old. He lost his parents at 14 years old. He went into depression as a young man. Had different points at which he tried to take his own life. I mean, he, he, he was at this point where he said, I can't take it anymore. My life is just too hard. And then he met Jesus. He encountered the risen, living Jesus Christ who we celebrated just this last Easter and who we celebrate every day, that he's alive, he's powerful, he's good and loving. And so he met Jesus Christ. And so I I looked online to try to find a picture of him. This picture is about 27 years old, all right? So this is 27 years ago, and he's still living today. But I want you to see a picture of David Ring after he met Jesus and kept pressing on with his life, didn't quit, didn't give up, pressing on. Here's a picture of David Ring. I want you to see this. I want you to notice something. He's sitting next to his wife, who he was supposed to never have. And he's sitting with his three daughters and his son, who he was supposed to never have. And he could communicate. He actually has traveled all over the world and talked about his faith. And he's challenged people and encouraged people and inspired people. And the first time I heard him speak, what I loved was he had this little refrain he'd come back to. He'd talk about people's challenges and what they were going through and, and don't, don't give up and don't quit. And then he'd, he'd look right at the camera and he'd say this. He'd say, I have cerebral palsy. What's your problem? And I remember as a young Christian, that when I heard him say that, I just thought, yeah, okay, <laughs> this guy's pressing on. This guy's holding on to Jesus in the hard times, and he inspired me. So here's the question. How do you stand strong when the world is crashing down? And here's the answer. You stand on Jesus, the resurrected, living, loving Jesus. His foundation is strong, and it will be all you need. And where do you draw the line? You know, for Daniel, it was his faith. He said, I can can flex with things. I can work with things. But man, when it comes to my faith, don't you mess with that. 
So I want to give you some, just some responses to this question. How do you stand strong when the world is crashing down? I want to give you a number of responses, and I want you to think about these responses and how they can speak to your heart, and you can stand strong in these coming days and weeks and months and all the years of your life. How do you stand strong when the world is crashing down? Number one, determine that the condition of the world will not determine the condition of your faith. Make a decision, the condition of this world will not define my faith. But my faith will help me respond to what's happening in the world. If you, if you build the condition of your faith on economic realities, your faith will go up and down with the stock markets and up and down with your personal deals and, and life experiences, and you will live on a roller coaster. If you, if you base your life on the political party you support being in office and being control. Boy, boy my, my party's in charge. God's on the throne. My party's not in charge. I guess God isn't on the throne anymore. No, God's always on the throne. And sometimes your team wins and sometimes your team loses, but God is always victorious. That's what we have to understand. We stand strong when the world's crashing down when we determine that the condition of the world will not determine the condition of my faith. That stands alone. It's locked in the reality and the power of Jesus. How do you stand strong when the world's crashing down? Number two, recognize that God is still on the throne even when the world is crashing down. Daniel looked and he saw that Nebuchadnezzar was on the throne of Babylon. No question about it. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was powerful, authoritative, had an angry streak in him, a tough guy, and he was on the throne. But Daniel looked beyond the human throne to the divine throne of heaven. And Daniel saw Yahweh, the God of us, our God, the God of the universe. He saw God on the throne of heaven. And he said, okay, Nebuchadnezzar may be on the throne down here, but I know who's on the throne of thrones as the king of kings. And I worship him. And he stood strong in that. We have to understand who's on the throne. Even when the world is crashing down, on the throne of my life is my Savior. On the throne of each day is Jesus Christ, my Lord. Over all of eternity is the sovereign God of the universe. Do you live with that certainty, with that confidence, with that assurance? So when your eyes are fixated on whatever the political world says, who's in charge? Who's in charge now? Who has more power now? You say, all of that, that's important, and we need to vote. We need to get engaged. I'm not saying don't be a part of that. But that's not the final authority. God's on the throne. Keep your eyes on the throne of heaven. See who rules and reigns there, and you will have a whole lot more peace in your life and strength when the world seems to be crashing down. How do you stand strong when the world is crashing down? Here's a third thing. Flex and negotiate on non-essentials and be uncompromising on core issues of faith. That's what Daniel did. When it came to the non-essentials, Daniel, you got to wear some different clothes. You got to wear the clothes of the Babylonians. Okay, fine. You know, Daniel, you got to learn a new language. You have to speak like a Babylonian. Okay, fine. Daniel, we're going to change your food. And for Daniel, his food was part of his faith. It may not make sense to us, but you have to understand that for Daniel, his food and his faith were locked together, and he was not going to compromise. So he risked saying, listen, can we come up with another program? And God blessed him for it. But, but he drew a line there. So flex and negotiate on the non-essentials and uncompromise on the core issues. So as a church, for Shoreline Church, we'll negotiate on style. It's not, it's not, style is not a defining factor of our faith. So we'll try different styles and different ways of doing things. We'll try different methodologies. Uh, when it comes to non-essential things, we'll keep them non-essential. But when it comes to the word of God, this book, this is the truth of God and the word of God from beginning to end, and we know it's true. We don't compromise. When it comes to Jesus Christ, that he and he alone is Savior because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We hold to Jesus Christ. When it comes to our core doctrines that make us Christian, we hold to them and we don't compromise. So negotiate on the side issues and stand strong on the core issues. How do you stand strong when the world is crashing down? Number four. I love this. Make a clear plan, express it, and pursue it in the power of God. When Daniel heard that he was supposed to be eating foods that for him would make him unclean, that would compromise his faith, he made a plan. And he came and he said, okay, so what about this? What about if we try some different food? What if we try it for a certain amount of days? Then you can assess. It's like he laid out a whole flow chart of the plan. 
And he brings it, and it was compelling. And God gave favor, but also Daniel was clear and articulate and thought through, let's try this. Let's give it a shot. It made sense. And in a time like this, can I encourage you to, to when, when things are going crazy around you, don't go crazy with them. When life's coming apart, don't get lazy and just go, well, I guess I'll just flow with, I'll just kind of flow with the, the process of things crashing around me. But look and say, I can make a plan. You should have a financial plan. And it should look different than it looked six weeks ago. Why? Because the world has changed. Have you really looked closely at your finances and thought that through? You should. You should. You should make a plan for your own spiritual growth and your family's spiritual growth in this moment in time. Make the plan, express it, pursue it. Be intentional about it. Here at Shoreline, we've been functioning a certain way and a certain economic reality. The world is changing. You know what we're doing? We're saying, okay, how do we plan for the future? Not the future we, gosh, we hope there would be, the future that it looks like it's gonna be. Is that lack faith? No. I mean, Daniel, Daniel could have said, I'm not in Babylon. I'm still in Jerusalem. Uh, the city hasn't been besieged and everything's fine. I claim it in Jesus', you know, Jesus name, the, the Messiah's name. He could, he could, but he didn't. You know why? Because he watched the city fall. That was reality. And in this new reality, he made a plan to live for God the best he could in that moment in history. It's not a lack of faith for me, for me to, as a pastor to say to you, we're having to rethink as a church how we do. We're worshiping different. We're doing education differently. We're doing everything differently. But we're, play, we're not just going to let things define where we go. We're looking, praying, seeking the Lord, and then planning and executing on those plans. You should do that in your own life, and I encourage you to. What's your personal health and fitness plan for the next month? It probably looks like, well, my gym's closed. I can't work out. You've got to get more creative. But make a plan and walk into it. And then number five, how do you stand strong when the world is crashing down? Number five, recognize the gifts of, that God has given you and lean into them. Boy, in times like this, God needs your gifts to come alive. For Daniel, he had a gift to interpret dreams. He had a, he had a gift of wisdom, and he, he leaned into his gifts. And as you walk through the book of Daniel, you see that, that his gifts flourished and grew, and God gifted them in this time. What's your gifting? And how are you using it in this season? If you have leadership gifts, how are you growing as a leader? If you have compassion gifts, are you showing compassion to your neighbors? Are you getting involved here at Shoreline with our food pantry, with our lake council, with different ministries that we're trying to, we're trying to find new ways to bring compassion to our community? And you may want to be part of that. And so we're going to be sharing some of the things that we're planning and ways that we can mobilize our people to bring the love of Jesus to our community. Maybe you have generosity gifts. There's a spiritual gift of generosity. And you say, I'm still in a place where I'm doing well. You know, a lot of people can't give right now because the, the, they're struggling financially, but I can give. Man, that's part of your gifting. Maybe you have service gifts. And you say, how can I serve in my home? How do I serve more effectively? In my neighborhood, how do I serve more effectively? Here's my question for you today. Where do you need to stand in the storm? Where is it that you need to stand strong and be firm? And I want to challenge you to read the book of Daniel. Our daily reading each week is Daniel's chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, over seven days, and we're reading that for three weeks in a row. I encourage you to read the book of Daniel. The opening said, we're going to get to the ending part of the book later in the series. But for the next few weeks, read a chapter a day and read through Daniel again and again and again. And watch how he stood strong in the storm. And let God inspire you. And cry out to Jesus and hold his hand and receive his strength. I want to pray right now for you right where you're at that God would give you the strength you need to stand in this storm. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we're in a storm right now on a national level, on a state level here in California, unlike anything most of us have ever experienced, and we hope a storm that's worse than anything we ever will experience in our lifetime. And we pray, oh God, that we would look to you for strength and we would stand strong in this storm. It would not destroy our faith, but it would clarify our faith and strengthen our faith. Lord, draw near to us. Fill us with your power. Strengthen us to stand in the storm and to shine the light of Jesus in a dark time. We pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. Well, I'm gonna give you a couple of words before I send you off with a word of blessing into the rest of your day. First, I wanna encourage you to go to the Shoreline website just for current information. 
Check in every couple of days on our website and just see what's going on. We'll keep, if you go to the website, you'll see what's going on. We'll keep you uh, aware of what's happening there. And also, if you're not getting the Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, little devotionals and updates, you can go on the website and you can click there and, and subscribe to get those so you kind of know what's going on three days a week. Also, if you need prayer for anything, there's a number on the screen right now for prayer, and you call and let us know your burdens, your joys, please let us pray. We've got people waiting to pray with you online, on the phone, and so please let us know what your prayer needs are. If you're new at Shoreline, and we know there's some new people joining us online, whether you're in a different part of the world, a different part of the country, or right here in Monterey, we welcome you. We wish we were face-to-face where we could give you a personal welcome, but we welcome you. And if you want to know more about Shoreline, uh, go to the, go to the uh, email that you see there on the screen and just send us a note. Say, hey, I, know, I want to know more about this or this or this. I promise you someone will get back with you very quickly and answer any questions you have. And in a moment after I give you a word of blessing to close, I want to ask you, after the word of blessing, just take a few moments and watch the video that's going to come on just to highlight a couple important things for you to be aware of. So as we close our time today, I hope and pray that the worship has inspired you, that the prayer has drawn you into the presence of God, and I hope and pray that God's word is alive in your heart. As you walk into this week, will you remember that even in the greatest of storms, will you keep this picture in your mind, that God is on the throne of heaven. He rules, he reigns over you, your life, and even over our crazy world. Above it all, God is on the throne. So trust in him and walk in peace. God bless you and have a great week.